surprise, here I am again. Um, I'm going to give you, I'm going to try to give the same kind of summary I gave with the time scale, which is to go through everybody's talks that had to do with animals, marine and non-marine. And if I misrepresent you, please tell me afterwards. Anyway, this is a, uh, just for those of you who missed this in my talk, this is a picture that was taken during the Casimovian. Shows a Dimetrodon attacking an Ereops or something like that, or maybe they're playing games, I don't know. But anyway, uh, next slide. Okay, so um, Yu Kun Shi presented a very interesting discussion of what I would call a relatively new Chinese database on biodiversity or paleodiversity. And I don't even know. So I hope somebody, I was going to upload the Fawn et al. paper to the Dropbox. Hopefully you Kun did it or somebody. But this is a paper that really bears looking at. And what it shows is a what's called this Carboniferous Permian biodiversification event, where you see that diversity is increasing um, pretty much steadily through the Carboniferous up to the early Permian. But there is this significant drop in the Casimovian, which she drew our attention to. And one thing I'll say that's interesting, you know, I'm, as you probably know from my earlier remarks, I'm not a fan of the paleobiology database. I think it's a very flawed uh, work, but it apparently recovers a similar drop in diversity, in marine diversity during the um, Casimovian. Um, next slide. So here's another one of her slides that kind of shows you more detail, you know, whose who's diversity is dropping, um, you know, which groups are suffering the most diversity drop. And typically, you know, in my experience, when we see these diversity drops, what they usually are driven by are high rates of extinction that co-occur with low origination rates. And low origination rates actually are, in, to me, are sometimes more important than actual extinction rates. And a lot of these dips in diversity reflect low origination rates. Now, one interesting thing I should say, because I brought this up, is I think we can move beyond the Stanley and Powell um, sluggish evolution of the Carboniferous. The, certainly the Chinese data set doesn't show depressed diversity and, and low origination and extinction rates throughout the Carboniferous. I think Stanley and Powell's analysis is mostly an artifact of the database they used. And I, I, I don't think they used the paleobiology database because if I remember, Steve Stanley has his own database that he published in a very long article in paleobiology some years ago. So, of course, one thing I worried about, I brought this up, is um, the Casimovian is, is the shortest stage of the Carboniferous. So to me, that would mean it might have relatively low rock volume, therefore relatively low fossil record. And we have to wonder how much of these diversity changes are simply, you could call them taphonomic or depositional artifacts of that. And that's something worth uh, considering here. Next slide. Well, then um, uh, Moran Sevenosic showed us a, a more detailed look at one group, the crinoids. And they don't really show that pattern, although this is, I think, if I remember, this is the pattern for North American crinoids. And the one thing I draw your attention to is notice how origination rates, the red lines, do really drop in the Casimovian. There's no apparent extinction or overall drop in crinoid diversity, but there is a definite drop in origination rates. And uh, of course, that's occurring. Uh, later than the beginning of the Casimovian, it's occurring sometime in the Casimovian. And of course, it would be interesting to have more, to look in more uh, detailed way at other groups, the, the, which are in the database of um, Yukon Shi for China, the brachiopods, et cetera, but are not so well understood perhaps in the North American or global databases. But apparently from what she told us, that work is underway. Next slide. Well, I, I just showed this earlier. This is an important result that Steve Roscoe and Jim Barrick reported that there is an extinction, at least well-documented in the Des Moinesian. And it's not, you know, it, that's not a big extinction, although it is for some groups. I mean, Kytides is a pretty common fossil in the, in the Des Moinesian and some of the older um, token rocks in North America. So it, it going away matters, but there are these extinctions, They're, they must be very selective within these groups. There is no mass extinction that anybody's uh, associated with the Casimovian. Next slide. And I also showed this one again, this is Ueno. 
showing us this major turnover in the fusilinid record. So I guess what I came away from the marine talks with was the notion that there is some biotic turnover in the realm during the uh, Casamobian, some significant turnover, I should say. Uh, this is a big biological event, the replacement of fusilinids with schwagerinid. Uh, that, that's a big change. There are conodont changes, ammonites, bra some brachiopods, and then at least in the Chinese data set, perhaps mirrored by the paleobiology database, there is some sort of a drop off in marine biodiversity within the Casamovian as we cur currently understand it. Next slide. Okay, then let's go on land. This, of course, this was just an hour ago or so. Uh, um, Stimson, Matt Stimson talked about looking at the trace fossil record, both of invertebrates and, and vertebrates on land. And, you know, this is quite a diverse record, but uh, let's see the next slide. I think one of the most important points Matt made is when you look at ichnodiversity, okay, and that being the number of ichnogenera or ichnospecies, it's not really the same as what we think of as biodiversity. This is really the diversity of behavior. It's not exactly taxonomic diversity. It has a relationship to taxonomic diversity, but I think he well showed that that relationship is not linear. It's very complicated. And so what you're really seeing here is, is the evolution of, of new types of behavior, if you want to call it that. And there doesn't seem to be a lot happening, at least from the compilation of Batois and Mangano in the Casamovi. You're seeing a steady increase in diversity uh, of the trace fossils, the invertebrate traces. And then you have a big spike in the early Permian. And honestly, I would argue that's probably just an artifact of, of what Dave Rout years ago called the monographic effect. I think there's been a lot more work on early Permian invertebrate traces in the red beds than there really has been in some of the Pennsylvanian rocks. And so I would argue that's just a study, an artifact of differential study. Next slide. Perhaps what's a little more interesting is looking at ichno disparity, sort of the differences between body types. And, but even that is a tricky business because as he showed, um, we can have the same trace made by rather different animals. You know, Diplocnides, which is generally thought of as the walking trace of a millipede, a myriapod or whatever. We know for, even from actualistic work that, that Nick Minter and Simon Brady did that cockroaches, other uh, cockroaches, I had to bring cockroaches in here, didn't I? Um, we, we know that cockroaches and other arthropods can make Diplocnides or it can appear as Matt showed as an undertrack from something uh, as, as disparate as a horseshoe crab, a limulet. So the ICHNO data are, are hard to, for invertebrates are hard to interpret because they don't really correspond, you know, in a, to, to taxa. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, but there's a lot more to do here. Next slide. And then Mike Donovan talked about arthropod herbivory, you know, which is really quite remarkable, you know, all the insects chewing on leaves and things like that. And of course, there's a diverse record of that, but not as good of a record probably as we really need, I think, to see what might be uh, some patterns. Next slide. And so Mike pointed out, you know, that by Casamovian time, it was clear, you know, uh, Bill, first time I heard this term mixed flora is Bill DeMichael, pitched it, I don't know where it come, if he coined it, but mixed floras being the kind of floras we associate with the Casamovian, where you have both wet uh, adapted plants and dry plants often growing together on the same landscape. And what's clear is by Casamovian time, there were arthropods feeding on these mixed floras. There's definitely a record of that. Now, the question is, you know, when did that really first appear? How did it first develop? That's, that's an interesting problem that I think needs more data to fully resolve. Next slide. And then Mike's conclusions, and, and we also got some of this from, from Sandra, uh, a, an understanding, nobody talks specifically about the insect record, but Sandra put a big part of that in her talk and Mike did too. So we know there's this big diversification of insects during the Pennsylvanian. I think that record also suffers from the taphonomic mega bias. I talked about in that there's a huge amount of Westphalian insects, you know, coming from the coal swamps and all that. I, I really think that's a factor in here. And we see the, the innovation, the proliferation of all sorts of forms of arthropod 
herbivory that we see today. So you could say, you know, in terms of eating plants, arthropods were already way up the curve by Pennsylvanian time. You know, they, they've already innovated and created most of the ways of feeding that we see in later uh, assemblages. But I think my, my take from Mike's talk is that there is no big change in arthropod herbivory, at least from what he showed, evident across the Moscovian casamovian boundary. Some of that suffers from a lack of data, but it may be that, that every way you could eat a plant, if you were an arthropod, was already in place sometime in the Moscovian, and there wasn't any real innovation driven by the change in vegetation. You just moved on. I mean, is it that different? I mean, I guess Jonathan Wilson would, would probably say there might be differences. That's a good question. Is it really that different to eat some of these different plants in terms of the mechanical and nutritional barriers to chomping down on a pteridosperm versus um, something, you know, uh, something, I mean, I know probably calamite is trouble, maybe conifers are harder, you know, that's an interesting question. And I know that's been addressed. Next slide. And then I've broken Matt's talks now because the tetrapod footprint record is directly related to the bone record. And the reason is that people like me who study tetrapod footprints, we think of the track taxa as proxies for biotaxa. We don't just think of them as behaviors. Um, so for example, bat track ichnus, the track shown on the left, is associated with us by us with, with temnospondyl amphibians, small temnospondyls. And so when we think bat track ichnus, um, that ichnogenus is a proxy for temnospondyli. Trouble is temnospondyli is like a superorder or something. So it's not a very small taxon, but at least the footprint acts as a proxy for a biotaxon when you think about it. And I think as Matt showed, there's no question there is a change in the footprint ichnofauna as we go from say Westphalian to Stephanian time, however you want to put it. The trouble is it's not well constrained. We have very few Casimovian truly definitively Casimonian track sites. But by the time we get to the Gajelian, we have a very different footprint fauna. And in my mind, uh, that footprint fauna, it reflects the diversification of reptiles of, of amniotes that we then, and that footprint fauna goes right into the Permian and it well reflects. In fact, uh, the, the two uh, track makers on the right here, the center and right are, are one is an areosolid of uh, one of the earliest true reptiles and the other one's a pelicosaur. And these are tracks we first find in the late Pennsylvanian. And if you know the early Permian track record, they're very common there as well. Next slide. And then my God, here we go again with my talk and all these are the wonderful illustrations. Um, I, I think the biggest thing I want you to take home from my talk is again, that there's this, this big bias in the record. A lot of these aquatic animals are overrepresented, if you will, at least in the Westphalian. They're, they're the coal swamp denizens that we know a lot about. And then when we go into the later Pennsylvanian, we get more terrestrial animals like, like the two shown in the lower panels here. And that is a real change. The aquatics continue, they're there if you're in the right facies. But what isn't in the Westphalian, and, and mind you, the record's bias is we don't see any, a lot of these uh, uh, terrestrial tetrapods. Next slide. So yeah, the, I, I, I think uh, everything we've been talking about on land at least should be filtered through this, this idea that there is a big mega bias. I'm sure this affects our understanding of the flora, the arthropods, the tetrapods, et cetera. And it's something we gotta keep in mind as a, as a caveat in our analysis. We're not looking at um, what would be called an isotaphonomic system. Going from Moscovian to Casimovian on land is rarely isotaphonomic. There's usually, a, 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 and similar facies. There's usually a big facies change and the taphonomy changes as well. And that affects our understanding of the fossil record on land. Next slide. And then I talked about this, you know, once we get into the late Pennsylvanian, again, we still have uh, aquatic tetrapod assemblages like the Kinney Brick Quarry, which is about 20 kilometers from where I'm sitting right now, where we have this marine embayment and our tetrapods are four taxa of clearly very aquatic looking amphibians and sort of endemic like that. But then we have something we never really had before. You know, we have these red beds, fluvial red beds in the later Pennsylvania, and they're not common, uh, but we have them here in New Mexico at the Canyon del Cobre. 
course, Ron showed us some um, uh, rocks in the Appalachian Basin, Glenshaw, you know, paleos, uh, uh, calcareous paleosols, things that are obviously well-drained floodplain deposits. And what do we get? We get all these terrestrial animals that we never saw before. And the timing of all that is tricky. It's not well constrained, but it, it's a real change. Next slide. And again, you know, if you look at diversity, this is intriguing to me. There's a drop in tetrapod diversity in the Casimovia. There's a drop in marine uh, diversity. Are they related? Do they have something to do with each other? Or are they, are they just uh, the result of different data sets? Or is this an artifact? Is the terrestrial thing an artifact of just collecting and rock volume or whatever? This is something we really haven't discussed. Next slide. So again, you know, I would say on land, and, and you know, this is one of the big messages of the meeting to me. You know, I've been involved in, some of you know, I've, I've been involved in what I call the extinction business, you know, where we argue about end Triassic extinctions and Permian. And typically we often focus on these big events. And, and to me, those big events are the search for easy answers. Enormous volcanic fields, asteroids falling out of the sky, boom, and everything changes. Everybody here though is not looking for easy answers. We're looking for uh, kind of complex answers to complex questions, even to the point where Sandra has saying, hey, well, what about some null hypotheses? You know, I'm a, I'm a very trendy guy. I'm a paleontologist. I like to think, God, climate change, then vegetation change, then the guys who chomped on the vegetation changed, and the guys who chomped on the chompers changed. You know, I wanna see this, this kind of cascading effect. But then I've got Jonathan Wilson telling me, oh, no, no, wait a second, man. There's some feedback going on. You change the plants, they, the chance, they model the landscape too. So I think one of the great things about the meeting has been that we've all uh, realized we're looking at something very complicated. There are no simple answers. There's no rocks falling out of the sky in the Casimovian. So we're all, um, I think that's been a good result here. And uh, next slide. So what I, you know, the question I would ask is, you know, obviously we know a lot happened on land and sea, but it doesn't look like there was anything big and synchronous either on land or on the sea. There's a lot of diachronity what's happening. So, you know, what is really going on here? And also I caution again, the Casimovian is a short piece of geologic time. It's the shortest Carboniferous stage, however it's defined. And could it be that some of this is being um, biased by uh, just a uh, lack of rock record, lack of fossil record relative to other time periods? That's something we, we really need to keep in mind. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Oh, and I, I, I need to say Cantabrian. You need to? Well, just to finish. I mean, the Cantabrian yeah. is on my mind. Well, thank you, Spencer. Um, I'm sure that's not it for you. We still have discussion. Um, do we have any specific questions for Spencer about the about his discussion of the animals? Well, let me ask somebody, what about a synchronous land sea set of extinctions in the Casamovian or diversity drops? Anybody have an opinion on that? That's an answer. Nobody has an opinion. I'm sure there are plenty of opinions out there. Everybody's got an opinion that the old saying goes. Um, well, you know, I think there are some things that are interesting that uh, I would go back to Phil Heckel's talk with the cyclothems and the fact that those uh, events are correlatable in certain parts of the world. Um, and but even between basins, they're only partially correlatable depending on the extent of sea level rise and, and sorts of things like that that are happening. And you would wonder um, if things could be correlated within that framework, even to start someplace and nucleate it. I think back to like Brett Bennington's work in the earlier part of the Pennsylvania where he was following black shell faunas one to the next and looking at assembly and disassembly of those marine communities. So, it, I think it's a place to start. To just have to start someplace for looking. Once you have these set of questions in your mind, I like Sandra's thing. I, I do know that um, 
Uh, one of my colleagues, Gary Graves, has worked with an, another guy, and they've done null model uh, uh, work on bird faunas in South America to look at at um, explaining the ecological distribution of these birds. And there's a whole, some of you may remember, there are huge debates in ecology about null models. What are the correct null models? Uh, all that sort of thing. But I don't, I don't ever recall that being a, a major debate in paleontology on null model debates. Um, I don't know if anyone here does. That? There, there was a paper years ago by Gould et al. You know where they generated phylogenies at random. They right. ran a Monte Carlo simulation, right. which was kind of a null model. I mean, another thing that I wonder about. You brought up Phil has published articles where they correlated or attempted to correlate cyclothems between North America and say the Moscow Basin. But one of the problems is there's a lot of chaos in the sedimentary system. There's a certain amount of chaotic behavior, and I wonder. You know, that always confounds our attempts at analysis. And we haven't talked about that either. I mean, is there a certain amount of chaotic behavior in these biological systems that's also what we're picking up? There are also things that lead us astray, I think, as Phil and I were talking earlier at one point about the Glenn Merrill and um, I forget his co-author uh, was at Michigan, now retired. They did a, um, an analysis of cyclothemic sequences in the Illinois basin and came to the conclusion that there were no such things. And, uh, uh, and of course, the, the place they chose in the Illinois basin was up on the, the margin. They didn't really go to the Illinois survey and say, give us a 2000 foot core. They chose a sort of a compressed section and they showed, well, we don't see it here. So <clears throat> that's because they started off not believing in it. And they were looking for some place where they could show that it didn't exist. And those kinds of spanners in the works can really throw those of us who don't know what we're, what these guys are doing off track. So it's, it's almost necessary to call out phony studies and show that this, this is wrong, you know, and we're all afraid to do that. None of us want to do that kind of thing. Well, I'm not, I'm not averse to doing that, but one of the other problems we face is we don't have a single chronostratigraphic language. We, we can all, we haven't all agreed on what's the Casimovian and, you know, we have, we have those problems of correlation too. And a lot of what we're talking about depends on timing. You know, we want to know when did this happen? When did that happen? And are they synchronous? And typically in paleontology, at least when they're synchronous, we think they may be causally related, right? So, you know, how do you know what caused an extinction? You just look for some big nasty event at the same time and you assume that's what did it, yeah. right? And in this case, what causes the vegetation to change? Well, what's a big nasty event? You just drop all the ice, you have a big interglacial or something and you change climate. And that's kind of the way our mind thinks, I think it's, those are easy answers to difficult problems. But the key thing is we have real problems with chronology here, not just defining the Casimony, but even how we correlate, and particularly when we get on land. I mean, what impresses me about the glacial story is how difficult it is to get, to figure out what age those ice sheets actually are in Gondwana, you know, that relies on palynology. Now we're getting DZ and all that. It's improved, but I know, I'm sure when John Isbell came to Gondwana glaciation, the age control on most of the events was very sketchy. You know? and there is John Isbell. John. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think what Neil Griffiths and Erica Bronson and others have done with uh, some of the ashes and dating them has really moved us forward a long ways. But, uh, you know, you were mentioning how do you correlate from the Illinois Basin to the Moscow? How do you cross the equator? Uh, and how do you go into the Southern Hemisphere during these time frames? And, you know, in terms of correlation, we have a hard time correlating from one part of Gondwana to another, but it's almost impossible to think about going and correlating from Gondwana into Laurasia. Uh, that, you know, that's a really difficult problem. Uh, and a lot of, I think, our understanding of eustatics and climate and everything else is dependent on trying to link glaciation to what's going on in the Northern Hemisphere. And until we finally get a handle on 
uh, being able to correlate from one area to another. And, uh, you know, the, the GIA concept is valid, which I think it is because it seems to be valid today and it seems to be in the Pleistocene and the Ordovician. Uh, sea level change is uh, opposite. Uh, when the Southern Hemisphere and near field is going down is during deglaciation, whereas that's when sea level's coming up here and you know, there are just all kinds of problems uh, to cross, cross from one hemisphere to the other. That makes a good point. And I, I wanna point out, um, there's a paper in the GSL volume, I've uploaded it in the Dropbox by Carlos Gonzalez, where he talks about the marine section in Argentina. And one of the points I took away from it is you can't even recognize the Mississippi and Pennsylvanian boundary in the marine of Argentina, according to him. So these are, you know, and this is marine correlation. We're not talking just non-marine. So there, there are real problems going, you know, north-south. We off, my mindset is always east-west because for me, the whole Carboniferous world is between Arizona and Czechoslov Czech Republic. You know what I mean? Ron, Ron Martino, you had a comment? Yeah, just briefly on Glenn Merrill. Uh, he has done a great deal of, of work with Conodonts and, uh, in fact, established uh, that there were at least three marine units in Kentucky that were all being referred to as the Brush Creek and actually had a lower Brush Creek, upper Brush Creek and, and uh, Cambridge. Uh, but I recall, he, my point is that he was a, 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 an ardent advocate of autocyclic mechanisms and that uh, it was, in his view, very difficult to trace any particular horizon very far. And I remember being on an outcrop with him where he, in Kentucky where he made the claim or assertion that this channel sandstone that cut down into the Ames marine zone had winnowed the Ames limestone and uh, it created this locally, uh, you know, biosparite type of, uh, or grainstone because of the influence of this channel. And I, I pointed out to him that this channel cross cut a very mature, fairly thick paleosol that capped the Ames and that there was no way that this channel sandstone could be coeval with the Ames. And so uh, again, he, he was a strong advocate of autocyclic processes and, and, and uh, I, I just think he kind of ignored or would rather not you know, take into account the fact that a lot of these things were actually allocyclic. I think you're exactly right, Ron. And, and <clears throat> a lot of the, it, and not to pick on, on Glenn Merrill. Um, no, I don't mean to do that at all. No, neither, neither do I. But it's, it's uh, I think that there are, we have to always watch out for the old theory-driven versus data-driven approaches to things. And we want to bounce back and forth between you know, something that's often called reciprocal illumination, where we, we, need to, you know, we need to have a theory, and then we need to have data. And when the data don't fit, the data don't fit. That's the way it goes. Something's wrong. Something's almost always wrong. Almost all of our hypotheses are wrong because there's data someplace that doesn't fit. So we have to keep modifying and modifying. But, but Glenn certainly came out of the John Firm school of autocyclic uber alles. You know, it was, uh, th there was no climate, um, et cetera. There was, was no use to, use to see. That's why I'm a big advocate of the method of multiple working prejudices. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> approach the rock record. I'm, 